I actually prepared with a footnote only to the small uh, science of uh, the science of small things, and the illustration is a piece of artifact here. If you want to know a little bit more about the objects of uh, toothpick containers, and you have seen China uh, versions of this function. You could have the aesthetic beauty that you marveled at, but you also could have a sort of discomfort. Uh, looking at the form of this toothpick holder, it's not the same as other similar objects available in the Carpathian Basin. They are usually very um, rectangular, which were actually produced and manufactured in a China factory near Vienna. And uh, also raised the question to anyone who was uh, researching the history of the toothpick holders. Now, if uh, it was a, uh, why weren't they possible to um, transform these kind of toothpick holders into, to bring them into Hungary? Because there was another uh, manufacturing company in uh, the south of Germany which preferred the round forms. And this in Hungary, which sort of follows the oval forms, and there are some other round forms, but still horizontal on the two sides. It's something unheard of in Hungary. Although the basic structural characteristics sort of evoke the toothpick holders that we once were familiar with. If you came a little bit closer, you could see these are beautiful floral patterns. And perhaps you should know that China ware is usually painted by women. And despite the fact that we have mass production here, but there are no two similar ones because you can't paint the same ones. No matter how many you want to collect, they will all be different. Anyone who does not understand why I'm doing this to you, well, I can tell you that in Elamir Hankush's book, The Unfinished Man, there are two uh, pages devoted to the beauty of a salt shaker. I think you, it's, it's worthwhile taking a look at this wonderful two pages because you will have plenty of food for thought. But I'm going to make a new pass, pave a new way, uh, following in his footsteps. Uh, we have no toothpicks in the toothpick holder. But at the end of the 19th century, I could not have had because there were no toothpicks available. The toothpicks were provided from manually from um, the, um, the feather of the geese. And other, the higher uh, parts of the society had very unique things made of gold, made of uh, aluminium. It, they were made very personalized. They had their own individual toothpicks and solving their own hygienic and sanitary problems. But in order to have uniquely manufactured wooden toothpicks, uh, we had to wait a little bit longer, uh, probably uh, due to economic, social, culture, and other problems. But I'm going to share the hypothesis with my audience here. That Elamir Hankish was a new historian, a seditious one. He was actually, well, why don't we have the toothpick in this holder is something that he would have wondered at. It was a, a long compound sentence. And if I want to ask this, follow the same structure and ask if at the end of the 19th century, a manufacturer in um, Massachusetts uh, and the son of this person uh, wanting to become a manager and had he not chosen Brazil, maybe we wouldn't have ended up with uh, two wooden toothpicks, mass produced wooden toothpicks, because Brazil was the only country in the world where at that time, People were using toothpicks made of wood, rosewood, by the Brazilian elite at that time. 
which actually sort of saves overseas the wooden toothpick culture. And this is what the Massachusetts-based person realizes when visiting Brazil and realizes the wonderful opportunity of making toothpicks and in one moment basically condemns this old traditional toothpick company to death. And now, only offering you a few brief insights into the history of toothpicks, there is a, a number printed at the bottom of the China ware. Uh, we should unveil the secret and tell you that this was uh, a left on China company number, which is nothing but a tradesman um, commercial vendor from Budapest who escaped to the United States and during the Second World War he realizes that the China were produced in Japan would work wonderful on the American market and George Zoltan Lefton's company commences to start uh, commences to produce such things uh, makes wonderful sortiments and in which you can find three such toothpick holders which are a little bit of a step away from the Central European identity and following the Art Nouveau spirit and uh, squeezing the spirit into the uh, manufacturing of, uh, uh, of toothpick holders. I think it's a beautiful cultural hybrid, a wonderful symbol and allow me not to mention any more details from left and life. Now, why did I say all this? I think it was worth introducing the history because of the parallelism of Hunkish's uh, salt shaker is because objects which could be used as illustration and the story behind the objects and the mental objects and the cooperation and the interlinkedness of these things I think could be a basis for new forces, new ideas and pretty big things if you come to think of it. If we look at objects, things and we organize them into a functional system it's something like uh, uh, the process uh, of new historicism which was a kind of direction at the end of the 1990s. If you look at the books by Grimblad, also popular in Hungary, and if you try to follow the history of a bishop, for instance, or if you make a statement that one manuscript discovery of a humanist somebody discovers something and then saves this act into the new world and then maybe establishes modernity and the period of renaissance. I think this is something you can see the parallelism between that and my toothpick holder. Allow me to finish by saying that although Hankish was a new historian and not following the old traditional uh, convictions and concepts. He sets up new categories, new constructions, but we did not mention or have not mentioned the kind of background on which he relied very heavily, complex systems in, 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 uh, uh, in literature, in history, in politics. So he's also uh, somehow sat into a systematic approach. And what I also wanted to say which is another hypothesis which is not crystallized yet, that archaeologists describe this meeting of three things, objects, people, and concepts. It's the t it has been described as the entanglement of things. And it can actually generate a fantastic reconstruction of power once we are able to grab, grab or grasp uh, the, the, the major notions and major points of these meeting points. Uh, Ted Dawson also came up with a novel notion. He coined intertwingularity, which was a new, new idea, which says that mutually interlinked things or objects will 
um, create a big unity because uh, based on the networks and due to the networks which allows us to get to different places so it's the intertwingularity refers to the final outcome I think in many social sciences uh, Show, uh, describe this as a kind of no human turn. This is one aspect or one explanation. You can get to one point from several directions, and historians usually are the, the flag wavers of, of, of such a, a process. So, Honkish could actually look at one single object and he could end up um, uh, in, in to describe the word freedom. So from this non-human turn, he always stopped at notions and people. He was not so much interested in objects. Thank you.